Good morning, everyone. Certainly we are mindful of why we are here today. And brethren around the world are assembled for the same purpose. But let us not also forget, but remember what tomorrow is. A very important day in our country. And we enjoy, of course, the fruits of that day today. And may we use the freedom that we have to his honor and to his glory. Amen. Stewardship. Steward. Steward is the concept of managing what has been entrusted to us whether it is people or things. But also, in stewardship, there is an accountability. Those of you that are employees, or those of you that are in management, or perhaps might be, have been an employee, or have been in management, realize accountability. The Lord taught the concept of accountability in the parable in Matthew 24 of the parable of the talents, which most of us are familiar with. The man, one man was given five talents, which was a, actually a sum of money at that time, two and one, and they were each, of course, accountable for what had been entrusted to them. And the Lord, of course, in that particular parable brings, brings forth the very important point again, of accountability. Paul made this observation in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, Let a man so consider us as servants of God and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. We understand that. Paul admonished Timothy in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 12 to do not neglect the gift that has been given to you. We have studied, of course, over the course of our lifetime, many sermons on, on stewardship. Stewardship of time, stewardship of abilities, stewardship of money. But this morning, I want to center our attention on one specific area. Stewardship of knowledge. Now, if you, and I don't think many of you are accustomed to going to sleep with, with Kevin, but if you are, I would encourage you not to do that. Uh, you can get by with him, but not with me. Not, to, not today, please. If you are a child of God, if you are a disciple of Christ, this ought to prick your attention. Stewardship of knowledge. I begin by calling your attention to two selections of scriptures, Romans chapter 12, and then we'll be turning also in a few moments to 1 Peter. Romans chapter 12, as we begin reading in verse 4. Romans chapter 12, and we begin in verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and members, and, and individually members one of another. Now watch carefully what follows. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given uh, to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Of ministry, let us use it as in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives in liberality, he who leads in diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Back to verse 7. He who teaches in teaching. If you are a child of God, you have that ability. Oh, yes. Now, stay tuned. 
Go with me now to 1 Peter chapter, chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. And Peter gives us some of the very same instructions worded a little differently. 1 Peter chapter 4, and I want to share with you verses 10 and 11. But as each one has received the gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. I want to burn these two scriptures in your mind. Romans chapter 12 and 1 Peter chapter 4. The concept of stewardship of knowledge. I want to present to you four questions that each of us must ask and answer ourselves. And we'll be answering those in the course of our study this morning. Question number one, how many hours over the years have you attended Bible study classes in preaching and increased in knowledge? Do the math. Question number two, how many evangelism classes such as Fishers of Men have you taken and gained Bible knowledge and tools to teach and evangelize. Question number three. How many hours have you spent in personal Bible study to gain knowledge and to grow in the faith and in faith? Number four. What kind of steward are you in using the knowledge entrusted to you? Hope you'll give serious thought to those four questions because we're going to pursue to answer those this morning. We learn, of course, and we appreciate better example. Don't tell me, show me. So we're going to share with you this morning a number of examples of those who were good stewards of the knowledge of the truth that had been entrusted to them. Get your Bibles, and first of all, go with me to Mark chapter 5. We're going to put these in the order of the books of the Bible. So we have to do a whole lot of turning. This is a man, we don't even know his name, we don't even know his age, a man that was, who lived in a tomb that we would say that was simply crazy. And then Jesus said to him in verse, in verse 8, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then as we read on the account, of course, the people were just amazed at what had happened to this man. But I want to pick up now in verse 18. And when he, he being Jesus, got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them the great things the Lord has done for you and how he has, and has had compassion on you. Whoops, did you hear that? Let me read that again, verse 19. Go home to your friends. And tell them the great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in, De in, in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. This man was a good steward of what he had received. John chapter 4, a very familiar account of the woman who Jesus met at Jacob's well and the conversation that in, in, uh, in, 
was involved there in chapter 4. The subject regarding water and then the subject regarding her personal life. Then we find as we read in verses 28 and 29. And the woman then left the water pot and went, in, in, went into the city and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all things I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And then we drop down to verse 39 of this account. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, he urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. But what did she do? She opened the door. She was a good steward of what she knew and what she had learned. Turn to Acts chapter 8, verses 4 and 5. The first few verses deal with the persecution that Saul or Paul had brought upon the church. But then we read in verses 4 and 5. Therefore those who were <clears throat> scattered went everywhere preaching the word. And Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. Did you read, did you read verse 4? Acts 8 and verse 4. Hey, brethren, that's us in this. That was not the apostles. They stayed in Jerusalem. That's the usins. That's us. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Go with me now to the next chapter, chapter 9. And let's begin in verse 18. The verses prior to this is, of course, the account of of Saul or Paul going on the road to Damascus. The Christ appeared to him going into Damascus and being taught there by Ananias. Verse 18. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. And so when he had received food, he was strengthened, and Saul spent days with the disciples at Damascus. Immediately. Did you hear that? Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogue, and he is a son of God. And all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who call on, on his name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so that we might, he might bring them bound to the chief priests? So Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that Jesus is the Christ. Immediately, he was a steward, a good steward of what had been entrusted to him. Turn to Acts chapter 18, and we begin reading in verse 24. We learn best, do we not, by example? Now, a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexander, an eloquent man, mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he had desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. Wow. What another tremendous example of one who was a good steward. Chapter 19, verses 8 through 10. And he went into the synagogue, this is Paul, and spoke boldly three months, reasoning and persuading certain concerning the things of the kingdom of God. And where some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. 
And, and this continued for two years so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Wow. What an example. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 as we again learn best by example. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 as we begin in verse 5. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. For you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believed. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we need not to say anything. We learn best by example. And then Paul's admonition to the young Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. And the things that you have heard from among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Do you begin to get the picture and the concept of stewardship? Stewardship of knowledge. Now let's look at two scriptures regarding the church in general. First of, first of all, Romans chapter 10. Verses 17 and 18. Romans chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not all heard? Yes, indeed. Their sound has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. <coughs> Did you grasp, brethren, what that said? Turn with me now to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 23. For we have another scripture that gives us the general concept of what happened in the first century. Colossians chapter 1 verse 23. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you heard, which was preached. Are you ready for this? which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Wow. What a picture we get from these examples of being good stewards of knowledge. Now, all this time, we are need to be answering those questions that we raised earlier. Discipleship, disciples who have not been good stewards, who have not grown in stewardship of knowledge, receives strong rebukes. Turn me to Hebrews chapter 5. And let's begin in verse 12. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, what time? How long had they been Christians? How long had they been disciples? How long had they been born into the family? Long enough. That's all we know. For through by this time you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God and have come need of milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes of only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. We know, brethren, what we do not use, you lose. That's exactly what happened here. We know that. 
We know that physically. And of course, we as well know it spiritually. In the letter to the, uh, one of the letters to the seven churches of Asia in Revelation chapter 2, to particularly to the church at uh, Ephesus, the Lord writes these words. Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. To the angel of the church at Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the golden uh, uh, lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil. You have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. You have preserved and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and, I, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from whence you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove the lampstand from its place unless you repent. Wow. That ought to perk up us, our ears up as we consider stewardship of knowledge. Because, see, those at Ephesus had left their first love. I think you can see very clearly from the scriptures the, the accountability that we have regarding stewardship of knowledge and I hope and I pray that we will not think of someone boy I wish oh so and so was here to hear this but oh so and so is not here but we are accountability but this is not just something that uh, is peculiar to the gospel follow along with me back to the book of Ezekiel the book of Ezekiel, chapter 33. The book of Ezekiel, chapter 33, beginning in verse 1. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of, of your people and say to them, when I bring the sword upon the land, and the people of the land take a man from their territory and make him their watchman, when he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his hand. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take warning, his blood shall be upon himself, he who takes warning will save his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet and the people are not warned and the sword comes and takes away person from, uh, from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I require at the watchman's hands. So you, son of man, I've made you a watchman of the house of Israel. Therefore you shall hear the word of my mouth and warn them for me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked of his way. That, wick, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Brother, I don't know when I read that, I get a chill up my back. That's serious business. Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he dies in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. So stewardship of knowledge is not just limited, to, or was not just limited to the gospel. I want to share with you again uh, some scriptures that will help you understand, for, ex for example, the, the concept of stewardship. Again, go with me, first of all, to the book of Colossians, chapter 1. And we'll look at several uh, scriptures here that, that Paul was very conscious, but not only him, but he was very conscious of this concept of stewardship, of knowledge. Colossians, chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. 
And I rejoice in my sufferings for you. Fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. Note particularly verse 25. Of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you. Did you hear that? Which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Paul's knowledge was not just for himself. It was for the body of Christ. He tells the Thessalonians, again, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 24 and uh, First Thessalonians, I'm, uh, chapter 2, I'm sorry. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it deceit. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. Brethren, we have been entrusted with the gospel. What are we doing with it? What kind of steward are we with the knowledge that we have? As Paul was laying his life down, evidently close to the end, or he thought it was, he said this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. Not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Then I call your attention to a statement made by Peter in 2 Peter chapter 1 and beginning in verse 12. Peter had previously had given them, of course, the exhortation of growth, of spiritual security. And then he closes with these, letter, with these thoughts, 2 Peter 1 and verse 12. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know them and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus has showed me. Moreover, I will, care I will carefully be to assure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. Wow, was Peter ever mindful and accountability of the stewardship of knowledge. How about you? How about me? But then I'm asking for and an, for an honest appraisal of our stewardship. We don't have to answer to one another. We have to answer to the Lord. I close with two statements, one again by Paul and another one by Peter. Paul said in Romans chapter 1, in verse 14, beginning, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Now brethren, when you, whether you have little knowledge or great knowledge, you have a responsibility of stewardship. Certainly, everybody cannot stand up here and do what I'm doing. Everyone cannot teach a class as some of you teach classes. But 
every one of us has knowledge because we obey that knowledge. Whether we have little knowledge or great knowledge. Did you notice what Paul said in Romans 1 and verse 15? For as much as that is in me, I'm ready. How about you? How about you? You see this sitting on my head? This is not snow. This is real stuff, and I see a lot of it out there. We never stop growing, and therefore we never stop being accountable for the knowledge that we have. Listen again to 1 Peter chapter 4 that we read a moment ago. And I want to read again verses 10 and 11 as we close. 1 Peter chapter 4. As each one has received a gift. Remember in the parable of the, uh, of, of the talents? There was five, two, and one. Why did one receive five and another two and another one? Each according to their ability. It's the same with each one of us. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. In all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and the dominion forever and forever. Amen. I want to reread in closing those four questions that I asked earlier. Please listen carefully. Number one, how many hours have you, over the years, have you attended Bible study and classes in preaching and increased in knowledge? Number two, how many evangelism classes, such as Fishers of Men, have you taken and gained Bible knowledge and tools to teach and evangelize? Number three, how many hours have you spent in personal study to gain knowledge of the faith and personal faith? And then number four, what kind of steward are you in using the knowledge entrusted to you? Of course, this has been very obviously a lesson directed to the body of Christ. If you're here this morning and you have never heard, believed, and obeyed that gospel, here's an opportunity. God's amazing grace has been given to the world through the death of Christ some 2,000 years ago. That gospel, that power is waiting to be a part of your life if you will receive it into your life in obedience, in believing Christ to be the Son of God, turning from your sins, and acknowledging that faith in Christ as you are baptized into the body of Christ to be cleansed through the blood of Christ. Or if there is a need that you have as a brother or sister, the opportunity is now as we stand to sing the song that has been previously announced.